This question for you. What do you say to the people who plan on sitting this election out? Same thing that was said to me when I was a young kid getting out of school during the civil rights movement. If you don't do something about it, you're to blame. You're responsible. Now we're about to show you more clips from Joe Biden and figure out who's actually responsible. Uh, my guess is not the voters, but Joe Biden himself. But we'll let you be the judge. John, what more do you have on the story? Well, we've got some fascinating clips actually. That was of course Joe Biden in an appearance on WURD's The Source with uh, Andrea Lawful Sanders. And as you saw there, he basically said, if you, st if you sit out, you're responsible. Not just for your own actions, but seemingly responsible for whatever ends up happening to America or its government. Um, that's one way to try to persuade people to vote for you. What people are calling for Biden to do, of course, is to reassure people that he has the capacity to not only be president, but to campaign in a way that gives people confidence he can actually win this thing. Now, that's not necessarily what he focused on in the actual appearance, but let's turn to what he did actually do. We have him talking a little bit about Trump and lodging some not incredibly strong attacks against his opponent. Now he's saying, if he loses in 2024, there'll be a bloodbath. Can you imagine the president saying that? Sorry. Bloodbath? Can I imagine? Just, no, I, 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 I really mean it. And so the Supreme Court just issued a decision that threatens America principle that there are no kings in America, that no one is above the law. He gave Trump complete power to use his office to exact revenge, organize a coup. Well, as a dictator, because they give him, if he's doing it in his capacity as an office, based on how this gets interpreted, that he has immunity. My God, my God, the stakes are really high. They're really high. Democracy, freedom, our economy are all on the line. So show up and vote for your own safety sake. Show up and vote for your own safety sake. So what you hear him saying, they're focusing on Donald Trump and the threat that Donald Trump poses to our government, the threat that Donald Trump nominated and confirmed Supreme Court justices pose to the country is a big threat to the country is I would say a great reason to vote for Joe Biden if Joe Biden is the nominee on election day. It is not a great argument for him to be the nominee though. Because if we do believe him, if we agree with him that the stakes are incredibly high, well then all the more reason to have the strongest possible candidate and right now, I don't think there's a lot of voters that need to be convinced that Donald Trump is threatening or bad. Those who can be convinced of that arguably have been over the last basically a decade. What they're worried about right now is whether he's gonna be able to beat him. And so talking about Donald Trump is just not a way to accomplish that. And it's not to say that he doesn't have sort of a strategy for the campaign to try to reassure people. He's doing some other radio interviews. He obviously has a big interview with George Stephanopoulos later on tonight. They're gonna be doing what they're calling an aggressive travel schedule this month that will take him and the first lady and the second gentleman to every battleground state following calls from allies to ramp up campaigning and public messaging efforts. That's a travel schedule. I will leave it to the historians to say whether it's aggressive or not. You should be heading to the battleground states in the months leading up to the election. But they also say they expect to engage in frequent off the cuff moments over the course of the month as he has consistently throughout this campaign, which starts off kind of reassuring and then gets incredibly defensive in its second half. But bear in mind that travel, at least according to him, is one of the reasons he's ended up in the difficult position that he's in because he has recently said that it was his travel around the world in the weeks leading up to the debate that led to him not being as prepared or energetic as he could have been. Of course, there was a gap of about a week and a half between the travel and the debate. So not all of this is super reassuring. And if you went into the last couple of days wondering how he's gonna manage this, people who were questioning whether he should be the nominee probably are not that reassured. But Jenk, what do you think? Thanks for watching. Our audience has helped build TYT into the media giant it is today. Together, we can accomplish anything. Support our work and join us at tyt.com slash team. Look guys, every time he talks, we're on pins and needles. And if you're worried that your candidate can't make it through the simplest interview in the world, he's the wrong candidate. There And there is no aggressive schedule, this is nonsense. Think about this, he had a debate on Thursday, epic debacle, country, the party's in the middle of a cave-in. All the senators are panicking, congressmen are panicking, governors are, etc. Uh, and now we're at Friday, eight days 
later. So he did a rando, rando pre-taped interview that you just saw there. By the way, in the middle of that interview, he called himself the first vice, uh, black vice president. Okay, uh, they're gonna say, oh, slip up. <laughs> yeah, but brother, you can't afford slip ups now, okay? So I know you're not great at talking, but that's another giant problem. And especially when you're down this much, he's now down to 36% approval rating. You cannot win if you're in the 30s. Remember, he's gotta mount a near miraculous comeback. He was already super far down. Now he's buried and he has to do the most miraculous political comeback literally in American history. Does it sound like he's the guy who's gonna be able to do that? And what would I have done otherwise? What would any strong, healthy Democratic candidate do? After that debate, if you screwed up the debate and you're worried about it, and especially if you've got an age issue and people are concerned about it, you go out there and do 12 interviews. You do them live, you do a press conference, you do events, and you show massive energy. And you say, this is how I fight back, right? And you do it with incredible vigor. One rando hidden interview, and now he's gonna go on with Stephanopoulos, and then they cut it down to 15 minutes. These are really bad signs when you can't handle a very, very, very normal interview with a former Democratic uh, you know, staffer, let's keep it real, on George Stephanopoulos. Look, he'll do the toughest interview he can. I'm not getting on Stephanopoulos. I'm just saying it's not a super hostile interview. And, you're good, and they're both pre-taped. Now, this, we're just biding our time, if you will, uh, until he's out. He's definitely going out. I called it earlier, now I've got it on an expedited schedule. I think he's going out by Monday. And so I know that's super aggressive, here we are on Friday. But he's not gonna survive that ABC interview. He's not gonna survive any of these appearances. I mean, he had a law, the simplest little affair in the lawn of the White House for 4th of July. And he said, ho, 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 happy 4th of July. No, wrong holiday, <laughs> wrong holiday. And then in other places, he's rambling and he's a disaster. And you see Secretary Austin in the background going, please finish, please finish, please finish. And that's how we all feel about the entire campaign. Ramesh. Yeah, I mean, everybody remembers four years ago, Biden was an extremely weak candidate who underperformed in the final votes uh, compared to actually the prediction um, you know, in various um, battleground states and, and moreover. And maybe we also remember four years ago when Biden was on the Breakfast Club where he basically said uh, to the audience that if you don't vote for me, you're not black. What's the point here, both with this story as well as that example from four years ago? You do not shame people to vote for you. You do not blame people who do not vote for you. You earn people's votes. <laughs> and how do you earn people's votes? Well, at this point, Biden, who was already trailing in polls before the debacle from last week, already had an incredible onus upon him to not just show health and vigor and energy and his ability to sustain himself, not just in a campaign outside of reading from a teleprompter, but to actually show that he had a legitimate vision for the US. And that's the other thing that's implicit, John, when you were describing the story and introducing the story a few moments ago is it often seems that the president is in denial of realities. And this is not merely a health and mental health issue. Um, you know, wait a second, you know, many times we hear, wait a second, this is the United States of America. What does he mean by that, right? It's like he's in denial of the reality, which we've talked about last time about Jenk, that Donald Trump is the biggest movement leader in the United States right now. There's a populism outside of it. And no matter what Biden says, which he keeps trying to do, saying reassuring people, things are fine, things are fine, when he's mentally able, things are fine, things are good, things are good. That's not how people perceive things to be. So you have to speak to how people perceive things to be, people perceive things to be that the democracy is broken, economic justice is, is broken, so many things are broken. And it's important for a candidate to show an actual vision of the future moving forward. And he's clearly not even capable of doing that, let alone doing the basics of participating in a debate and getting beaten without his mental health failing, right? And so yeah. this is a point that James Carville, David Axelrod, DNC insiders who do not particularly have much of a vision for the future in my opinion, or the people that they represented like Obama don't have a real vision for the future. They themselves are saying that what Biden needs to speak to, which requires a healthy person, is a vision of America moving forward that recognizes yeah. disaffection. 
Yeah, it, so look, it, the reason Carvel and I don't want Biden to be the nominee is not because we agree on policy. <laughs> but it's that we both want to win. It's not that complicated. So that's going to get get into the Kamala Harris conversation later in the live show. You know, the show's live Monday through Friday at six o'clock Eastern. So, uh, but uh, one more thing here, guys. Uh, 16 points. That's how much Joe Biden is down from when he barely won last time. So just stopping the bleeding, nowhere near good enough. Stay in place, nowhere near good enough. He has to stop the bleeding, stay, get him his legs under him, and then he's gonna pick up 16 miraculous points. <laughs> this is so beyond over. Anyone still saying that Biden should be the nominee is preposterous. Now I'm gonna have to go and do debates. I'm gonna do a debate mm -hmm. with Destiny. You can check it out right here on the Young Turks channel at five o'clock Eastern on, on Saturday. Uh, you know, and Joe Walsh, former Republican Congressman, who I often agree with. But I look, I don't know what the hell they're gonna say other than we're mental and we'd love to lose this election to Trump. That there's no defense of Biden if you wanna beat Trump. But if you wanna defer to authority and obey, then okay, you stick with Biden and go, oh, we'll take the loss. In fact, yeah. we'll take a landslide because now he's losing non-swing states, John. Well, I've been saying for some time, Jenk, that it definitely seems to be the case and it always has been back to you know Hillary Clinton. Like when they feel like they've got their person, they don't want to let go. They sink their teeth in and they won't release it. And it's easy for us as outsiders, I think, to see that and criticize it. But we don't know if we would do the same thing if a progressive was the candidate. And the reason we don't know that is it's literally never been the case. It would be cool someday if it was actually. <laughs> um, but anyway, you, you talked about stemming the bleeding. So let's turn to the other part of the strategy. So they're gonna spend $50 million, which is a lot of money on a paid media blitz in July. Okay, so they're gonna be doing what they're calling strategic investments designed to draw a whole bunch of eyes, including younger voters. So they're gonna focus on events like the Olympics, um, maybe they'll get Simone Biles to do an ad or something, uh, and the Republican National Convention. So they're gonna focus on battle, uh, battleground state voters and TV, radio, and digital ads. So the issues they're gonna focus on include abortion, the economy, and democracy. And all of that is fine. All of that is also exactly what they've been doing the entire time. So I'm not entirely sure how that's gonna radically change things. Maybe people will be paying more attention now than they were you know, three months, six months ago. But I would also make the case like if the only thing, the most important thing to you is Donald Trump losing in November, you likely do care about abortion, the economy and democracy. But I would make the case to you that Joe Biden is in no like way a great person to focus on those topics. The economy is doing better, but he is always going to be tied to what people consider very hard times during the first term. With democracy, he's not seen as a vigorous, strong defender on abortion. They didn't pass legislation in his first year to protect it. So look, in an abstract sense, he's a Democrat. He's gonna be fine on those things, but only as much as any other Democrat and not as much as others. Harris at least could focus on abortion in a way that he apparently, according to the debate, is not able to speak to it with passion. In terms of the economy, other candidates would not be tied to the last four years. They'd be able to just talk about going forward rather than being weighed down by it. And so it's fine to run these ads, but what they're describing here is not a radical departure or a new strategy. It's we're gonna go to the swing states, we're gonna run ads. That's just a campaign, that's literally any campaign. That's the campaign you had a month ago. You've been raising more money, maybe you can spend more. But this does not signal to me that they understand that they are in very different waters than they had been. Um, do you read any of this differently? Yeah, no, uh, so breaking news right now. Um, we're gonna cover uh, Mark Warner, a senator asking for Biden to drop out a little bit later in the live show. But Biden has just responded to it saying that he's quote, completely ruling that out, stepping down, completely ruling it out. Now, I don't believe him for a second. I think that they're trying to figure out what to do with Kamala Harris. I think they're trying to figure out how to certify the delegates. I think they're trying to get things done behind the scenes and remember, Whenever you're in this much trouble, you can't show any weakness. So if he said, "Oh, I'm considering it," it would only create a bigger frenzy. So he, no matter whether he's considering it or not, he has to say, "I'm definitely staying in the race." Either way, and it's not like he's got a truth-telling record to protect. I mean, he's been in this shape for at least six months. I would argue a lot longer, and they've been lying to you 
all along. So what's an extra couple of lies telling you, oh, we're not even considering it, right? So is the $50 million gonna make a difference? The hell no, there's a couple of billion dollars at a minimum is gonna be spent on a presidential race alone, actually far more than that. But they're burning that $50 million, spending it on Biden when he could actually give it to a super PAC who would spend it on the new candidate. So every dollar they spend on Biden is a dollar they can't spend on a a candidate who could actually beat Trump. And the idea that you're gonna run a standard campaign, which by the way, it's not even standard. Even the tiny amount of appearances he's gonna do, he's now strictly talking from a teleprompter. He says he's gonna go unscripted. I haven't seen it. The one time he went unscripted was on the lawn and he did like 90 seconds of rambling where they were all like, "Oh, please, please stop talking. And it looked terrible. So I, I don't believe a word they're saying. I think they're gonna burn that money and they're burning time. The new candidate needs time to get up and running and we have to need time to figure out who the new candidate's gonna be. They've gotta have a little bit of a tussle here and the strongest candidate has to emerge. Every single minute and dollar we spend on Biden is money absolutely wasted when we have no money or time to waste to beat Donald Trump. Yeah, and that's that's why, Cenk, we see donors, the mainstream media now, and centrist Democrats like Mark Warner, who's probably a pretty good buddy of Joe Biden's on many levels for probably many years, saying, hey, uh, this is pretty clear. Your clear mental health issues are, are you know, your age, you know, and I don't begrudge anyone for being old, but they should not be t making it so much about themselves or their family making it so much about themselves and their own power to take everybody down with them, right? And so if you actually look at this, look look at these three planks that you mentioned, John, economy, abortion, and democracy. With the economy, it's just eminently clear, sure, unemployment is down, but there but wages are not sufficient to keep up both with inflation as well as costs. And that's just a clear sort of writings on the wall issue that there has not really been a clear articulated set of policies and visions to combat. Um, the youngest generation is the first to make less than their parents in the history of the US. Guess what? They're not particularly psyched about Biden. Um, life expectancy is decreasing. They're not, that's not great. People can't afford housing. It's all being swooped up by the vanguards and these um, you know, holding companies. With democracy, what happened to the John Lewis voting rights bill? You know, what happened to trying to stop the filibuster or push legislation through with abortion? So I think it's just sort of like, you know, us progressives, we can see very clearly that, you know, you gotta walk the walk, right? So what have you actually done on these issues other than, you know, kind of use say sort of vague cliches about it. Um, but I think most people, most voters feel like uh, that things that they actually want, which might be tied to these three themes, economy, democracy, and abortion are not actually happening. So outside of the mental health stuff, the age stuff, which is clearly like, you know, crisis, <laughs> you know, red alarm crisis. The question of who has a political vision around these themes that why that 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 allude to why people are unhappy with the status quo is what's missing. And you know we've said this for years. Progressives are the ones with a vision, so it's actually absolutely critical. We not at this time not just I mean it's important to get Biden out of there, but also whoever comes in have to push a, a, at least some progressive vision into what they stand for. Yeah, they won't look. I just. I need anyone with literally a pulse. Like Ramesh is 100% right. Go towards economic populism. Talk about increasing people's wages during inflation. Duh. I mean, these are the bare minimum. Talk about universal health care, how you're gonna get people help. Talk about how you did the child tax credit for one year and it was a spectacular success. And if there's some bitch Republicans weren't in your way, you'd do it again. But this guy's not capable of any of that. It, do you, I don't know that Kamala Harris is capable of any of that. I just Is there a person who could speak in the Democratic Party? Put together sentences, be compelling, give a speech where people go, yeah, instead of going, oh no, it's a well, oh, oh, oh my God, oh, oh, thank God. Whew, he didn't say, oh, he died, oh, damn it, he said something crazy, like terrible again, or lost his train of thought, etc. If you're worried to death that your candidate is going to ruin every appearance that he has, and it's gonna make it worse, not better, and he's down 16 points from when he barely won. And you can't see that that's the wrong candidate, you're trying super hard not to see it. You blinded yourself on purpose because the cable news taught you obedience and told you, remember, 
You should, we should never have democracy within the Democratic Party as we try to protect democracy. We should anoint leaders. We anointed Hillary Clinton because she was the only one who could be, oops, be Trump. Then you anointed Biden in 2024. How is all this anointing turning out for us? Disastrously, let's go, let's go to the bullpen. Anyone who can pitch, let's go. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all of that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.